destructively critical when mistakes are made kills initiative and it's essential that we have many people with an initiative if we are to continue to grow. In fact, 3M first attempt at self-mutation beyond sandpaper and foray into automobile wax and polish introduced in 1924 proved to be a costly mistake and the company eventually discontinued the line. But its second mutation proved wildly successful. Working in the give it a try atmosphere created by McKnight, a young 3M employee named Dick Drew visited a customer site, an auto paint shop, and overheard a violent explosion of particularly vivid profanity. Two-tone auto paint jobs had become popular, but the improvised glues and adhesive tapes separating the two colors failed to mask properly, leaving behind ugly blotches and uneven lines. Can't anyone give us something that will work? Yelled the paint man, storming across the paint shop. We can, responded the 3M visitor. I'll bet we can adapt something at our lab to make foolproof masking tape. Drew discovered, however, that 3M had no such readily adaptable product in the lab, so that so, like any true 3M'er, he invented one. 3M masking tape. In response to an opportunity disguised as a problem. A process to be repeated thousands of times. 3M had finally made its first incremental shift away from sandpaper. Five years later, in response to companies that had contacted 3M looking for a waterproof packaging tape, Drew built on the masking tape technology and invented a product disdained to become a household item worldwide, scotch cellophane tape. Scotch, ha scotch tape wasn't planned. No one at 3M had any idea in 1920 that 3M would enter the tape business, and certainly no one expected that it would become the most important product line in the company that in the company by the mid 1930s. Scotch was a natural outgrowth of the organizational climate McKnight created not the result of a brilliant strategic plan. Even more important than Scotch tape itself, however, was the fact that 3M institutionalized the evolutionary process that led to Scotch tape. Richard P. Carton, director of research and later president of 3M, codified the strategy of variation and selection in 3M's technical guidance manual as early as 1925. We must process a two-fisted generating and testing process for ideas. Every idea evolved should have a chance to prove its worth. And this is true for two reasons. One, if it is good, we want it. Two, if it is not good, we will have purchased our insurance and peace of mind when we have proved it impractical. Figure 1A, branching evolutionary tree 
at 3N. It's a tree diagram. Words to the left, words to the right. I will start at the bottom and go from left to right. Trampin paper for printing to the left, to the right. Star mark pliables, markings for pavements. Also to the right, above. Center light paint. To the left, next tail paints to the right. Green light powder. Above that on a branch. Scotch. Scotch of film. To the left. Coated brand reflective liquids. To the left, above. 3M Corius structures. To the left, porous bearing. To the right, reflective tire sheeting. Above that, to the right, reflective fabric. To the left, scotch rock, reflective runway and pavement markings. To the right, plywood inspection. To the right, above, warehouse conveyor systems. To the left, patchwood for plywood. To the right, but still to the left, on a branch, glass bubbles. To the right, remote sensing railroad car identification. To the left, control tack adhesive. To the right, radiating microspheres. I mean, to the right, radio radiating microspheres. To the right of that, retrospective identification. To the left, laser fusion targeting. Targets to the left of the bark, still, but to the right, micro spheres to the left of the bark above data guard security films, and to the right of the bark, front rejection photography. Product evolution from Scotch Light reflective sheeting technology as of the mid-1970s as depicted by 3M corporations in its official history. Carlton also added two other key criteria for evaluating and selecting ideas. Criteria based on 3M's core ideology. First, for an idea to be selected, it had to be basically new. 3M only wanted to select innovative ideas. Second, it had to meet a demonstrable human need to solve a real problem. Innovation that didn't turn into products and processes that someone somewhere will find useful would be of no interest to 3M. Interestingly, however, 3M did not select innovations based strictly on market size with mottos like make a little, sell a little, and take small steps. 3M understood that big things often evolve from little things, but since you can't tell ahead of time which little things will turn into big things, you have to try lots of little things. Keep the ones that work and discard the ones that don't. Operating on a simple principle that no market No end product is so small as to be scorned. 3M adopted a policy of allowing people to sprout tiny twigs in response to problems and ideas. Most twigs wouldn't grow into anything, but any time a twig showed promise, 3M would allow it to grow into a full branch or perhaps even a full-fledged tree. 
This branching approach became so conscious at 3M that it sometimes explicitly depicted its product families in branching tree form figure 8. Figure 7A presents an example. The beauty of this the beauty of the 3M story is that the company transcended McKnight, Oki, Drew, Carlton, and all the other original individuals from the early days of 3M. They created a company, a mutation machine, that would continue to evolve independent of whoever happened to be chief executive. Although 3M's leaders could never predict where the company would go in the future, they had little doubt that it would go far. It became a ticking, whirring, clicking, clattering clock with a merit of tangible mechanisms well aligned to stimulate continual evolutionary progress. For example, machinism to stimulate progress at 3M. There's three columns. To the left is 15% rule, a long-standing traditional that encourages technical people to spend up to 15% of their time on projects of their own choosing an initiative. In the middle is a clock at 3 o'clock, pointing to the right. And to the right of that is to stimulate unplanned experimentation and variation that might turn into successful, albeit unexpected, innovations. To the left, 25% 25, 25% rule. Each division is expected to generate 25% of annual sales from new products and services introduced in the previous five years, up to 30% and shortened to the previous four years, beginning in 1993. And in the middle is a clock at 3 o'clock, pointing to the right. And to the right of that says, to stimulate continuous new product development. In 1988, for example, 32% of 3M's $10.6 billion came from new products introduced in the prior five years. To the left, Golden Step Award, granted to those responsible for successful new business ventures, originated within 3M. In the middle is 3 o'clock. To the right of that, to stimulate internal entrepreneurship and risk-taking. To the left, Genesis Grants internal venture capital, capital fund that distributes parcels of up to $50,000 for researchers to develop Prototypes of market tests. In the middle is three o'clock, and then to the right of it, to support external entrepreneurship and testing of new ideas. To the left, technology searching awards granted to those who develop a new technology and successfully share it with other divisions. In the middle is three o'clock. And to the right of that is to stimulate internal dissemination of technology and ideas. And then uh, to the left of that is Carton Society, a technical honor society whose members are chosen in recognition for their outstanding and original technical contributions within 3M. In the middle is 3 o'clock, and to the right of that is to stimulate the development of new technologies and innovation. To To the left, own business, 
opportunities. Three Emmers who successfully champion a new product then gets then get the opportunity to run it as his or her own project, department, or division, depending on sales levels of product. To in the middle is three o'clock, and to the right of that, to stimulate internal entrepreneurship. To the left, dual ladder, career track that allows technical and professional and professional people to move up without sacrificing their research or professional interests. In the middle is a clock at three o'clock. To the right, to stimulate innovation by allowing top professional and te- technical people to advance without having to switch to a managerial track. To the left, new product forum where all divisions share their latest products. In the middle is 3 o'clock. To the right is to stimulate new ideas across divisions. To the left, technical forums where 3M people present technical papers and exchange new ideas and findings with each other. In the middle is 3 o'clock. To the right of that is to stimulate cross-fertilization of ideas. Technology and innovation. <laughs> to the left, problem solving missions. Small hit teams sent out to customer sites in response to specific ID, idiosyncratic customers' problems. In the middle is a three o'clock. To the right of that, to stimulate innovation via customer problems that are the seeds of new opportunities, perpetually replicating the process by which 3M stumbled onto masking tape in the 1920s. On the left, high-impact problems. Each division selects one to three priority products to get to market within a short specific specified time frame in the middle is three o'clock to the right of that is to speed product development and market introduction cycles which thereby increases evolution evolutionary variation and selection cycles to the left small autonomous divisions and units, 42 product divisions in 1990, each with average annual sales of about $200 million, plants median size, 115 people, are spread across 40 states, mostly in small towns. In the middle is 3 o'clock. To the right of that is to stimulate individual initiative by promoting a small company within a big company field. To the left, early use of profit sharing introduced to key employees in 1916, expanded to almost all employees in 1937. In the middle is three o'clock. To the right of that, to stimulate a sense of individual investment in the overall financial success of the company and thereby stimulate individual effort and initiative. Propelled by these mechanisms, 3M had branched into over 60,000 products and over 40 separate product divisions by 1990. These span such wide-ranging categories as roofing granules, reflective highway signs, video recording tape, overhead projection systems, computer storage diskets, bioelectronic ears, and 3M post-it notes. Indeed, the ambiguous post-it notes present 
just one more example of 3M living according to the philosophy that you often get to where you're going by stumbling, but you can only stumble if you're moving. Posted Conventor Air Art Fry described, One day in 1974, while I was singing in church choir, I had one of those creative moments. To make it easier to find the songs we were going to sing at each Sunday service, I used to mark the places with little slips of paper, but they would flutter out at just the wrong time, leaving me frantic. I thought, gee, if I had a little adhesive on these bookmarks, that would be just the ticket. So I decided to check into Spence Silver's adhesive. Using the 15% rule of, of following the principle of experimental doodling, Spence Silver had invented the aberrant adhesive by just experimenting in the lab, mixing certain chemicals together just to see what would happen. He explained, The key to the post-it adhesive was doing the experiment. If I had factored it out beforehand and thought about it, I wouldn't have done the experiment. If I had really seriously cracked the books and gone through the literature, I would have stopped. The literature was full of examples that said you can't do this. Reflecting on this somewhat chaotic process, 3M executive Jeffrey Jeffrey Nicholson pointed out that a lot of the things that led to the post-it were accidental, incidental, accidental. But had Art Fry not been in an environment where people were doodling around with weird adhesives on their 15% time, he would not have come up with the product. Furthermore, had Fry and Silver been in an environment that discovered persistence, had 3M forbidden them from continuing to work on their crazy idea when initial market surveys indicated that the product would fail, 3M post-it notes wouldn't exist as a commercial product. And that is precisely the point, indeed, the way, the key point from 3M. Although the inventions of the post-it note might have been somewhat accidental, the creation of the 3M environment that allowed it was anything but an accident. The first, well, the stark contrast at Norton. Founded on a good concept, Norton, unlike 3M, made money from the start and by its 15th birthday had multiplied its investor capital 15-fold. See Appendix 2. While 3M was fighting simply to survive during the period 1902, to 1914, Norton became the industry leader in bonded abrasives and pr produced superb financial returns year after year. In 1914, Norton was, fin was fully 10 times the size and significantly more profitable than the struggling 3M company. Yet despite its vastly superior early life, Norton failed to keep pace with 3M's perpetual motion machine. 3M gradually over, overtook and eventually far suppressed Norton in both size and profitability. Size, there's a diagram. Or to the left, it starts, first column is size comparison. 
comparisons. And, and to the right, is the next column is 3M, the next column is Norton, and then the fourth column is ratio 3M to Norton. Nineteen four, at first, it starts from left to right. You know, left to right, move the columns. Or I just go statement. Size comparison. 1914 revenues, zero dollars. Under 3M is 264. Under Norton is 2,734. Ratio 3M to Norton is 10.10. Size comparison, 1929 revenue is zero. 3M, 5,500. Norton, 20,300. Ratio 3M to Norton, 20.27. Size comparison, 1943, revenue, zero. 3M, 47,200. Norton, 131,300. Ratio, 3M to Norton, 0.36. Size comparison, 1956, zero dollars. 3M, 330,000. 807 Norton 165,200 Ratio 3M to Norton 2.00 Size comparison 1966 Zero dollars 3M 1,152,630 Norton, 310,472. Ratio, 3M to Norton, 3.71. Size comparison, 1976, revenues, $0. 3M, 3,514,000. Ratio, 3M to Norton, 749,000. 749,655. Ratio 3M to Norton 4.69. Size comparison 1986 revenue zero. 3M 8,602,000. Norton 1,162,000. Ratio 3M to Norton 777. Size comparison, 1990, revenue zero, 3M, 13,021,000, Norton, Norton acquired, ratio 3M to Norton, Norton acquired, profitability comparison, Return on assets, 1962 to 1986, 3M, 34.36%. Norton, 17.72%. Ratio, 3M to Norton, 1.94. Return on equity, 1962 to 1986. 3M, 23.22%. Norton, 11.25%. Ratio, 3M to Norton, 2.06. Return of sales, 1962 to 1986. 3M, 20.27%. Norton, 9.42%. Ratio, 3M to Norton, 2.15. How did this happen? How did Norton lose its seemingly insurmountable lead over the failed mine from Minnesota? Norton first laid the groundwork for its decline relative to 3M during the period 1914 to 1945. While 3M installed management practices that encouraged individual initiative and experimentation, Norton created no explicit 
practices or mechanisms whatsoever to stimulate experimentation and unplanned evolution. While 3M had a relentless drive for progress and impulse for activity. Give it a try and quit. Norton became a highly centralized and bureaucratic firm characterized by routinization and stagnation. While 3M seized opportunities that led to waterproof sandpaper and scotch tape, Norton had an explicit policy not to encourage pursuit of new opportunities outside of its traditional product lines. In 1928, 85% of Norton's sales and 90% of profits came from Charles Norton's grinding wheel line. First introduced a quarter of a century earlier as a Norton research scientist described. Although we would play with the idea of doing research on new radically different products, almost all work involved making better grinding wheels. You could work on anything you wanted as long as it was round and had a roll, had a hole in it. Emphasis R's. During the late 1940s and 1950s, 3M pulled ahead, never to look back, while 3M decentralized and installed mechanisms to stimulate continued evolutionary progress. Norton remained centralized and concentrated primarily on cost cutting and efficiency, while 3M branched into seven separate product divisions by 1948 with less than 30% of revenues coming from abrasives. Norton still derived nearly 100% of its revenues from its traditional abrasives line. While 3M Scotch product family generated high cash flow used to fund the development of exciting new technologies like scotch light reflective sheeting and thermal fax copying technology, Norton's abrasive products face a mature market with slowing growth, overcapacity price cutting, and declining margins. In the late 1950s, Norton made a few feeble attempts to branch away from the maturing abrasives, abrasives industry. But most of these were started by lack of resources and institutional encouragement. Interestingly, Norton tried at one point to follow 3M's lead into adhesives, introducing a cellophane paper, cellophane tape in 1957, 27 years after 3M. But 3M Scotch brand proved to entrench and according to a Norton sales manager, we never got so bloody in our entire lives as competing against Scotch. But 1962, 3M had attained over three times the revenues and nearly twice the profit margins of Norton. Furthermore, whereas 3M had a wide array of attractive business units, stable cash generators like adhesives, high growth businesses like Scotchgard fabric protector and magnetic recording tape, and emerging markets like microfilm and fax, Norton still derived over 75% of its sales from its old line abrasive business. Even more important, 3M's mutation machine was clicking into full gear 
ensuring that it would continue to to stumble into thousands of new opportunities long into the future. Norton, in contrast, had ground to a virtual standstill. 2% sales growth, 0% profit growth, with no with no significant drive for progress over or tangible mechanisms to stimulate progress, wrote Charles W. Cheap in his well-researched historical account of Norton. By the 1960s, management was largely a caretaker operation to maintain existing modest profit levels and the possibility of selling the company. Finally, in response to declining stock multiples relative to 3M and Carboridum, Norton decided to make a certain, make a concerted effort to diversify and progress like 3M. Unlike 3M, however, Norton elected to attain this array primarily by corporate strategic planning and diversification by acquisition instead of by evolution. In fact, Norton became one of the first major clients and a dedicated disciple of the Boston Consulting Group. BCG and its portfolio management techniques instead of installing mechanisms to stimulate internal progress, Norton sought simply to buy progress. As Forbes magazine described, Norton runs its operations the way most investors run their portfolios. Indeed, one of the great ironies in comparing 3M and Norton comes in the fact that 3M has consistently had a portfolio of business units that would be the envy of any strategic planning consulting firm. 3M's portfolio looks benefit looks beautifully planned, just as species look perfectly created, but it actually came about largely by an undirected evolutionary process of variation and selection. 3M presents yet another classic example of how a creationist strategic planning perspective can so easily confuse the why and how. If we map 3M's portfolio of business units on a strategic planning matrix, we could easily see why the company is so successful. Look at all those cash cows and strategic stars, but the matrix would utterly fail to capture how this portfolio came to be in the first place. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, 3M continued to evolve into into new and often unexpected arenas by encouraging individual initiative. Norton, in contrast, relied primarily on studies and planning models handed down from its consultants. While 3M continued to stimulate progress by allowing people like Spencer spent silver to create new markets in part by accidents not calculations. Norton's president proclaimed that planning must be must become a way of life. While 3M encouraged scientific playfulness, Norton's management described its significant method as it's all derived from military planning. While 3M diversified primarily by selecting the best incremental opportunities that emerged from its 
fruitful and self-stimulated research efforts. Norton primarily emphasized wholesale acquisitions because internal technology and research resources offered limited opportunity. Finally, in 1990, 3M sailed on top, on to top, $13 billion in sales and hundreds of innovative new product introductions. Norton, in contrast, found itself the target of an unfriendly takeover bid and ceased to exist as an independent entity. This involved categorizing of businesses Units into a matrix of cash cows, stars, question marks, and dogs based on market share and market growth using this categoriz- categorization, a company would make investments, acquisitions, and divestitures. Lessons for CEOs, managers, and entrepreneurs. Using 3M as a blueprint for evolutionary progress at its best. Here are five basic lessons for stimulating evolutionary progress in a visionary company. One, give it a try and quick. For 3M, unlike Norton, the Midas operandi became when in doubt, very change solve the problem. Seize the opportunity. Experiment. Try something new. Consistent, of course, with the core ideology. Even if you can't predict precisely how things will turn out, do something. If one thing fails, try another. Fix, try, do, adjust, move, act. No matter what, do it. Don't sit still. Vigorous action, especially in response to unexpected opportunities or specific customer problems. Create variation. Had Mike had McKnight not asked why Oki sent his cryptic letter requesting grit samples. Or had Dick Drew not impulsively promised a solution for two-tone paint jobs? Or had Spence Silver not done the experiment that textbooks said could not work? Or had Art Fry not tried to solve his church choir book problem and so on for a thousand such ifs? then 3M wouldn't be a visionary company. Two, accept that mistakes will be made. Since you can't tell ahead of time which variations will prove to be favorable, you have to accept mistakes and failures as an integral part of the evolutionary process. Had 3M nailed Oki and drew to the wall or fired them for the failed car wax business, then 3M probably wouldn't have invented scotch tape. Remember Darwin's key phrase, multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. In order to have healthy evolution, you have to try enough experiments. Multiply of different types vary keep the ones that work let the strongest live and discard the ones that don't let the weakest die in other words you cannot have a vibrant self mutating system you cannot have a 3M without lots of failed experiments. As former 3M CEO Lewis Lerf put it, 
the secret if there is one is to dump the flops as soon as they are recognized but even the flops are valuable in certain ways if you learn from success but you have to work at it it's a lot easier to learn from a failure Keep in mind, J&J's paradoxical, paradoxical perspective described earlier in the chapter that failures, are mis- failures and mistakes have been an essential price to pay in creating a healthy branching tree that has not once posted a loss in 107 years at the same time, keep in mind a lesson from the chapter on cult-like cultures. A visionary company tolerates mistakes, but not sins, that is, branches of the core ideology. 3. Take small steps. Of course, it's easier to tolerate failed experiments when they are just that. Experiments not massive corporate failures keep in mind that small incremental incremental steps can form the basis of significant strategic shifts mcknight's simple answer to oki led to waterproof sandpaper opening a large mistake in the auto industry leading to Dick Drew's masking tape and then to Scotch cellophane tape, which shone recording tape, and so on. If you want to create a major strategic shift in a company, you might try becoming an incremental revolutionary and harnessing the power of small, visible successes to influence overall corporate strategy indeed if you really want to do something revolutionary it might be best to ask simply for permission to do an experiment recall american expresses incremental steps in financial services that eventually became the primary strategic pillar of the company, and how William DeLibba used small experiments to incrementally revolutionize the company into travel services. Keep in mind the image of twigs and branches, or consider the image of seeds and fruit used by Mazzaro Ibuka at Sony to convey the concept of small, idiosyncratic problems as the starting point of great big opportunity. Give four, give people the room they need. 3M provided greater operational anatomy operational autonomy and maintained a more decentralized structure than Norton a key step that enabled unplanned variations when you give people a lot of room to act you can't predict precisely what they'll do and this is good 3M had no idea what Silver, Fry, and Nicholson would do with their 15% discretionary time. In fact, the visionary companies decentralized more of more and provided greater operational uh, operational autonomy than the comparison companies in 12 out of 18 cases. Five were indistinguishable. To this lesson, we'd add a corollary. 
Allow people to be persistent. Although the Post-it clan had trouble convincing other three emmers that their weird, sticky little notes had merit, no one ever told them to stop working on it. Five. Mechanisms. Build that ticking clock. The beauty of the 3M story is that McKnight, Carton, and others translated the previous four points into tangible mechanisms working in alignment to stimulate evolutionary progress. A step Norton never took. Look back at the list of mechanisms at 3M. Notice how concrete they are. Notice how they send a consistent set of reinforcing signals. Notice how they have teeth. If you're a division manager, you damn well be better meet the 30% new product goal. If you want to become a technical hero at 3M, you'd better share your technology around the company. If you want to receive Golden Foot Award and become an entrepreneurial hero, you've got to create a successful new venture with actual products, satisfied customers, and profitable sales. Good intentions alone simply won't cut it. 3M doesn't just throw a bunch of smart people into a pot and hope that something will happen. 3M lights a hot fire under the pot and stirs vigorously. We find that managers often, understate, managers often underestimate the importance of this fifth lesson and fail to translate their intentions into tangible mechanisms. They erroneously think that if they just set the right leadership tone, people will experiment and try new things. No, it takes more than that. It requires putting, it, putting in place items that will continually stimulate and reinforce evolutionary behavior. Tick, bong, click, word. Richard Dawkins does a beautiful job of describing incrementalism as a potent evolutionary force in Chapter 3 of The Blind Watchmaker, New York, Norton, 1986. What not to do. We also found a number of cases where the comparison companies actively suppressed evolutionary progress at critical stages in their history. Lessons of what not to do. Chase Manhattan ruled by an obsessively controlling David Rockefeller during the 1960s and 1970s. Chase Manhattan, known as David's Bank, became a fear-filled environment where managers spent most of their time in meetings, not on making decisions and taking action. Chase managers lived with the mentality, Woo! One more day gone and I'm not in trouble. Even in the late 1980s, many senior managers at the bank wouldn't try it new ideas because David might not like it. In contrast, Citibank during the same era was a loosely structured company, uh, corporation fueled by, fueled by a chaotic kind of creativity. A corporate survival of the fittest among highly talented people well rewarded for championing innovative ideas. 
Barrows during the critical early stages of the computer industry, Burroughs President Ray W. McDonald stifled individual initiative. He drove away nearly all talented people who had a penchant for experimentation, experimentation and publicly humiliated managers for failure and mistakes. A man who had to prove he's the boss every day. McDonald centralized all power and decisions in himself, making the product managers almost a direct extension of his office. Instead of viewing customer problems as opportunities for evolution like 3M did, McDonald prided himself on keeping customers sullen but not rebellious. Even though Burroughs had a technical lead over IBM in computers in the early 1960s, McDonald inhabited his managers from seizing one of the biggest business opportunities of the century. Texas Texas Instruments, during the 1950s and 1960s, Texas Instruments attained well-deserved acclaim as a highly innovative company under the guidance of Chief Executive Patrick Hargerty, who created an environment where ideas and innovations bubbled up from the lowest levels of the company. However, Haggerty's successors, Mark Shepard and Fred Boosie, reversed this approach and instituted a top-down autocratic approach that obliterated, obliterated TI's entrepreneurial culture through fear and intimidation. If they saw something in a presentation they didn't like, they'd interrupt by saying, that's bullshit. If that's all you have to say, we don't want to hear it. They'd yell, pound tables, and throw objects across the room. As an XTI manager described, Shepard and Boosie don't have faith in their people. Lower managers lost a great deal of authority, but on their control, but of their control was shifted into headquarters. Purpose products were defined and redefined. Their ad infinitum eventually you were just given a product that was a square peg and told to fit it into the round hole of the market. During the late 1970s and 1980s, TI lost its position as one of the most most respected companies in America and suffered significant losses while continue to be widely admired and highly profitable. Stick to the knitting, stick to the core. In their 1982 book, In Search of Excellence, Peters and Waterman counseled stick to the knitting, meaning in their words, the odds for excellence performance seem strongly to favor those companies that stay reasonably close to the businesses they know. On the surface, such a, per, per, such a precept does not square with the evolutionary perspective we presented in this chapter. Indeed, if 3M had defined its knitting as mining or sanding, then 3M wouldn't be what it is today. 
nor would we have those and those fabulous post-it tape flags that may that have helped us keep organized while writing this book from our standpoint thank goodness 3m didn't stick to its knitting furthermore norton stuck much closer to its knitting than 3M. And just look at the results. Zenith 2 stuck much closer to its knitting television and radios than Molarola right into decline. J&J had no customer, no consumer goods experience when it began selling baby powder. Marriott had no background in hotels when it branched into that business. HP had no expertise in the computer business. In the 1960s, when it launched its first computer product, Disney had no knowledge of the theme park business when it created Disneyland. IBM had no background in electronics when it moved into computers. Boeing had virtually no experience in the commercial aircraft business when it did the 707. Had American Express stuck to its knitting, Freight Express, it probably wouldn't exist today. We're not saying that evolutionary progress equals wanton diversification or even that a focused business strategy is necessarily bad. Walmart, for example, has thus far remained resolutely focused on one industry, discount retailing, while simultaneously stimulating evolution without that narrow focus. Nor are we saying that the concept of stick to the knitting makes no sense. The real question is, what is the knitting in a visionary company? Our answer, it's core ideology. Preserve the core, stimulate progress. To far to the five lessons just given, with mu- we must therefore add a sixth. Never forget to preserve the core while stimulating evolutionary progress. Keep in mind that evolution involves both variation and selection. In a visionary company like 3M, selection involves two key questions. The first is simply pragmatic. Does it work? But just as important is the second question. Does it fit with our core ideology? Since the time of William McKnight, 3M has sought to create innovative solutions to real human problems. That's what the company is all about. Variations at 3M must be new, useful, and reliable, key elements of 3M's core ideology in order to stand a good chance of being selected. Certainly, no one at 3M would stop Spence Silver from spending 15%, from spending his 15% experimental doodling time on his bizarre glue that wouldn't glue. But equally important, 3M didn't select the mutant adhesive until Silver married into the Art Fry's church choir problem. Demonstrated to other 3Mers that the weird little sticky notes were useful and prove that they could be produced with 3M quality and reliability. You can't win a Genesis grant to develop a Me Too product at 3M. 
You don't become a member of the Carlton Society without an original technical contribution. You'll never survive as a division manager if your products prove consistently unreliable in consumer and customer hands. 3M stimulates progress with awesome vigor for a $13 billion company. But just as tenaciously preserves its core ideology. Similarly, if a Walmart experiment doesn't add value to customers, it will not be selected. If a J&J branch grows contrary to the Eroto, it will be pruned away. If a zealous marketing manager at Hewlett Packard tries to launch a mutant new business that makes no technical contribution, he or she will find little support. If a Marriott opportunity would cause the company to veer wildly from its purpose of making people of making people away from home feel that they're among friends and really want it, it will look instead for other opportunities. If a Sony seed leads only to technically mundane or low-quality fruit, the company will sow other seeds. Core ideology serves as a bonding glue and guiding force that holds a visionary company together while it mutates and evolves. For all its mutations, far-flung enterprises and small divisions, we found a remarkable cohesive at 3M. Indeed, 3Mers bond to their company with the same almost cult-like dedication we saw at P&G Disney and Nordstrom. The same holds true for HP Motorola and Walmart, three companies that rival 3M as self-mutation machines, yet cling tenaciously to their core ideologies. Like the genetic code in the natural world, which remains fixed while species vary and evolve, core ideology in a visionary company remains unchanged through all its mutations. Indeed, it is the very essence of these fixed guidings and guiding ideals that gives a visionary company something extra that evolving species in the natural world can never have a purpose and a spirit in the words of William McKnight reflecting on his 65 year relationship with 3M and its ideals it is proper to emphasize how much we depend on each other and our shared values our challenge while stressing this important lesson and humanity lesson of humanity lies in maintaining at the same time a proper respect for the individual to continue our progress and service to america and the world we need a healthy appreciation for those who exercise the option for excellence permitting the creation of something for all of us enriching lives with new ideas and products the best and hardest work is done in the spirit of adventure and challenge built to last successful habits of visionary companies. Jim Collins, best-selling author of Good to Great, and Jerry I. Perez, more than one million copies sold. Turnpike Plaza, 365 Rec Squad.